Thank you. Well, I'm going to start off um, and talk for the first 15 minutes, and then I'm going to hand over to Colin, who's going to um, conclude. And the idea of this talk really was to pull together um, some of the work that we've been doing jointly, but also some work that we've been doing with other colleagues. We've been pulling out some key themes and thinking about key themes with regards to the construction of megaliths in Britain and Ireland. And we're just going to sort of present various aspects um, of that work to you today. So I'm going to start off um, by talking about the project that we're doing together, which is the Building the Great Dolmens project. Um, and we're looking at this particular form of monument throughout um, Britain and Ireland, and hopefully on into Brittany um, after this conference finishes. So we're talking about dolmens as a very specific type of monument that's found in particular parts of Britain and Ireland. Um, you'll see from the distribution map here, particularly Western Britain, but, um, but also throughout um, a lot of Ireland. When we talk about these monuments, we're talking about um, a very specific type of monument that's really characterised um, by some very specific features. And just to show you some pictures of them here, these are monuments that um, they've been classified all, in all sorts of different ways um, in Britain and Ireland. Portal dolmens, um, particularly in Wales, and they're also known as portal tombs in Ireland. But for this project, we're just calling them dolmens as a, a, a general group. You can see from these images that they consist of essentially a large stone that's been uh, raised up um, and supported, and that's it. And we're very much in support of Chris's paper yesterday, suggesting that there was not a cairn around these monuments um, when they were initially constructed. They were, that's probably something that was added um, later on. So while these are very, very well-known monuments, they're visually very, very impressive monuments, um, surprisingly little is actually known about these. And there has been some good work, particularly in Ireland, um, on these, but we actually don't know a great deal about this type of monumentality. And the focus previously during excavation has very much been on the chamber area, looking for finds for material culture um, in order to get things like radiocarbon dates. A recent summary um, by Tatiana Kudmanow has published um, all of the available radiocarbon dates for these monuments in Britain and Ireland. And you can see from um, her um, distribution of those dates that they cover a really broad um, range from the early Neolithic right, right the way through into the Bronze Age. So these were clearly monuments that saw activity over potentially thousands of years. Our project isn't interested in um, when they were used. Our project is interested in the construction processes and how they were built. And that's really what I'm going to talk, the element of the project I'm going to talk to you um, about now. So if you were a person wishing to build um, a monument or build a dolmen in the, in the Neolithic, um, I just want to sort of run through the ideas that we've been having about the construction process and try and show you some evidence for how that actually works. Well, the first thing you need if you're going to build a dolmen is a big stone. And this is the biggest stone um, of all of the dolmens, um, which is um, over in Ireland. It really is an absolutely um, enormous stone that's been converted um, into this monument. And this is one of the key things that we're saying dolmen architecture is all about, the use of this big and impressive stone. Here's just another example. Um, again, this is um, Goward in, um, in Ireland. It's not just about a big stone, though. It's about presenting um, that stone in a particular way. This is Pentra Ivan. We saw it yesterday. I'm going to keep on showing you this site because it, it is really the sort of dolmen par excellence um, over in Wales. So the key thing here is it's not just about a big stone, but it's about presenting it, lifting it up and displaying it. And you can see here, um, it does work very well with this site, it's about getting the tiniest, tiniest little um, tips of the stone to support that massive capstone. Um, and Alistair Whittle um, suggested that it was about trying to show stones floating to the sky was, was his particular words. 
So how do you actually go about building um, a dolmen? I'm just referring here to the work um, by Menz um, in, in Brittany, um, and he looked in detail at the, at the various types of a way in which you quarry stone. Um, but with dolmens, it's much more straightforward. It's only his type one, and you can see that clearly again uh, with Pentra Ivan. And in fact, the way in which you construct a dolmen, and this seems to be consistent throughout Britain and Ireland, um, is you find yourself an outcrop, and it's the outcrop that you're converting into a dolmen monument. Um, and this is um, in the the top uh, right, you can actually see Pentra Ivan uh, in the background. This is a, a, an outcrop nearby, which is almost certainly what that capstone looked like before it was actually quarried. And I've just done some little drawings to try and sort of illustrate the process. Um, at the bottom is um, a stone that we came across again in Ireland, which again you can sort of see the idea that this is perhaps one that's already been quarried, it's already been dug um, out of the ground. The next thing you do um, when you're building yourself a dolmen um, is you actually just dig a very large pit around your outcrop. Um, and I've tried to illustrate that here. This is the, the, the dotted line is to show the bit that you're eventually going to lose. This is a site that we're currently excavating in Pembrokeshire Garn Turn. Um, and here we've opened, as you can see, a trench in the forecourt area. And our trenches were not big enough to actually pick up the whole of the pit, and we estimate that that's the size of the pit for this particular capstone. The capstone at Garn Turn is 85 tonnes, so you would need a large pit in order to expose um, that capstone. And we're going to go back this summer, extend our trenches, and find the edge of that particular pit. However, when we've looked back at sites that have already been excavated, we've found evidence for this pit elsewhere. This is Carrig Sampson, excavated by Francis Lynch in the 1970s, and she was surprised, and I suspect slightly horrified, to discover that her um, supporters of, the, again, a very large capstone, were just essentially dropped into a pit, and she suggested that the pit was where the capstone had been excavated and then simply raised up. There were no sockets, very little support um, for the uprights. Again, Pentra Ivan, uh, Chris Scar mentioned this yesterday. Um, Grimes excavated this, um, not to such a high standard, but again, he suggested um, a pit, and again, he suggested that this was where the capstone came from. And um, a site that you can still see this quite clearly, this is Arthur's Stone on the Gower in Wales, and you can actually still see the pit survives around, um, around the capstone and around the dolmen. And you can see the size and scale of the pit that you need to dig in order to get your, get your capstone. We've also found significant evidence that once you've, once you've dug your large pit, you've got your large stone, that the next thing you do is you shape the capstone. And we've got excellent evidence from a number of sites that the bottom of the capstone is being worked and shaped. From our own um, excavations at Garn Turn, we've got a large collection of hammer stones and a very large collection of flakes that have come off the bottom of the capstone where it's been flaked and shaped. And we's, we've observed this at other dolmen sites um, in Ireland and Britain. This is um, Brennan's Town near Dublin, and you can see the bottom of the capstone here has quite clearly been shaped to make it flat. And another site we've seen, this is Goward in County Down. Um, again, the bottom of the capstone has been pecked in this case to make it um, nice and flat. And as I say, we've got an enormous collection of um, flakes of the capstone from the bottom of the capstone in order to give it that flat profile from our own excavations. So um, that's, that's very useful to be able to look at the Chain Operatoire with regards and the shaping of the, uh, of the capstone. The next thing you need to do, so you've got your capstone, you've shaped your capstone, is you've got to lift it up 
in situ. And we're suggesting that this is exactly what happened. And this is sort of conjecture. Um, but we've been thinking about how you actually lift up and move your capstone around. The example, in, the largest example in Ireland is 160 tonnes of stone. Now, this is enormous stones to be, to be moving around. Um, but we're suggesting that actually it's a series of levers, the levering up your stone, chocking it underneath, and then keep on doing that again and again with my slightly ropey drawings there. And you can just sort of see how this would work. This is um, another Irish site, sort of that, that stone being very gradually lifted up um, actually in place. We then suggest that what you do is you replace that support with your uprights. And the key thing here is um, that this would work very effectively if you want to get this balancing effect that um, we've noticed at Pentra Ivan. So one of the thing, one of the suggestions previously has been um, that you would drag your stone into place, so you would move your capstone away, pop your uprights up, and then drag it into place. And these are actually images from the construction of Stonehenge, but it's the same sort of technology, ramps and dragging. But we suggest that that probably isn't what happened because you would struggle to get that minute detail with regards to the propping of the capstone. You'd, you know, it would get dragged off or it would be very difficult to achieve. So we are suggesting that it's literally lifted up in situ and then you very carefully pop your uprights in underneath to get this particular effect. It's interesting to note that um, quite clearly Neolithic people sort of knew what they were doing, but sometimes it all goes horribly, horribly wrong. So you've invested masses of time and energy, social status in constructing these monuments, and up it is, there is your big stone standing on its supporters, and it falls over bit of a sort of social disaster. This is the site where excavating Garn turn. 85 tonnes of stone went crashing backwards, we think, during or at the end of the construction process. That's one of the reasons we're actually investigating this site, is because we feel that there are good evidence for the construction process left. Um, and they seem to have simply abandoned this site um, when it all went horribly wrong. But actually, some of the sites which are considered successful sites, um, this is the largest Irish site again. You can see with this stone, this is the 160 tonne capstone, they haven't quite managed to get the, the back end up. It's sort of still sitting back in place. So they've done a sort of a fix it here and it looks like a dolmen but they've not quite managed to lift it up um, at the back. What we're arguing though with these monuments is the key thing about them is it's all about displaying stones. This is their, if you like, their primary role, what it's all about with dolmens, not about creating a burial space, um, but all about um, displaying very important and distinctive stones. So just to sort of sum up this little bit, this is the, the, the project that we're currently working on. Constructing dolmen really um, is a monumental task. It's quite risky and it involves quite a lot of planning. But once you're, once you're sort of up and running, it's a fairly quick result. It, you either display your stone or it comes crashing to the ground and it's a, a complete um, disaster. But of course, subsequently, these sites are converted into other monuments, converted into burial monuments in, in a number of examples. And this is where I want to now move on to um, a sort of a different theme that we've noticed in the construction of monuments in Britain and Ireland, um, what I call lazy architecture, or Colin prefers expedient architecture. And this is really the sort of the, the opposite of um, this sort of dis in a way, opposite of displaying big stones. And this is something that I've noticed in the site, this site, um, uh, which is Blast Hill, uh, which is a Clyde Cairn in Western Scotland. And it's something that Colin's going to pick up and talk about in more detail with the sites he's been working on. 
I excavated um, part of this site in 2009 with Gary Robinson at Bangor University, and we opened two trenches at the site. We were interested, again, in construction and sequence at this particular um, site. And I'm just going to talk to you here about Trench B. I'm not going to present to you the, the results of this excavation more broadly. But we were quite surprised when we opened up this trench because we're in a fairly exposed upland location here and we didn't anticipate having um, quite as much soil um, on this particular site. What we did find um, in this um, particular trench um, was a, a little primary phase. Um, we've seen this, um, a lot of people were talking about this yesterday, multiple phases um, at a lot of monuments. And this is not particularly surprising. Other Clyde Cairns in the area um, have this primary phase. But what we were surprised about was the sheer, as I say, the sheer amount of soil on top of this stone-built um, primary phase. And what we suggested, uh, what in fact the micromorphologist suggested, um, was that there was actually a very large turf mound added on top of the cairn um, at a later date. And this is a little reconstruction that we did where we've built up the turf just to sort of show you how quick and easy it is to build in turf on top of stone. And it's very, very um, effective. And we came up with, at the end of this excavation, a sequence um, um, of what happened at this particular site. There's that little primary cairn, probably another one added on. But the key thing is when it's converted into a larger cairn or a larger monument, um, which is much more typical of the Clyde tradition, they're actually using turf. They're not using stone. Um, this is this expedient architecture. And again, this is a site that's designed to be seen only from, one, only from one direction, which is it's designed to be seen looking up the valley in this way. And you can see, again, they haven't bothered putting stones in this side. They've just kind of fudged it. And this is what we mean by expedient architecture. They're trying to achieve something that's large and impressive, but they can't be bothered to put very much effort in. And this is indeed what we found. This is, um, it does look very impressive from here and from here, but it's just a real big mess down here, and they haven't bothered to put very much effort in. And in fact, they keep coming back to this monument and fiddling around with it, trying to make it look slightly different. At a later stage, um, we think that they're trying to make it look more Irish by putting um, stones here to kind of give it that more cork can appearance until eventually um, the thing goes um, into disrepair. And that's where I'm going to pass you over to Colin, who's going to pick up this issue and idea of expedient architecture in some of the examples that he's been looking at, particularly in the north of Britain. OK, I've got uh, 10 minutes to try and do a lot. The earlier papers, especially in this session, constantly, ref well, particularly reference the relationship between monumental construction and social organisation. So I want to start with this. This is um, basically just uh, illustrating a model which was put forward by Colin Renfrew, first of all in 1973, for Neolithic Wessex. And it's, this has been open to an awful lot of criticism, and very few people would now subscribe to it. But basically what he was arguing was that you start off the Neolithic with a small, what he calls a cephalous society, segmentary societies, and you have a process of social evolution that runs right the way through to the end of the, the Neolithic. And I'm, t I'm talking particularly about the British and Irish Neolithic here, which runs right the way through the Neolithic to the late Neolithic, where social, uh, the social formation has evolved into a chiefdom. So basically, from loosely knit groups through to a, a sort of broader, stronger political sort of situation. And he correlated that or with the different scales of monumentality. So you start off with fairly small uh, chambered tombs. And uh, in the case of Wessex, you, you start off with long barrows. You go through to course rate enclosures. And then ultimately, you end up with the large henge monuments and stone henge huge amounts, apparently huge amounts of labor involved, therefore a larger political organization or social organization. 
like I say, this has really been discredited and criticised in a whole series of levels from uh, social evolution through to this correlation between different sized monuments with different political uh, structures. But I think the truth is, and I'm not sure here whether it's just me <laughs> or whether it's a, a broader phenomenon, um, maybe uh, other my colleagues from Britain here would be in a better position to answer this, but I still have this in the back of my mind. I still kind of, even though not acknowledging this particular model, I, you know, if asked, well, what, what, what do you really think the early Neolithic's like? I'd still say, oh, well, I think it is kind of family groups. And, oh, well, what do you think the later Neolithic's like? Well, it, you know, slightly. I, it's, I think it's late, it seems to be latent in Neolithic studies. And it's this, it's this sort of basic idea of what the British Neolithic is like that um, I just want to, to go through now. And going into home ground to the north of Scotland to Orkney to look at this. And this, in this case, we have a, a small chamber too and the massive ring of Brodga in Orkney. I just put those up. A consequence or, or almost an unstated consequence of uh, the Renfrew scheme is that a sequence of monuments... Okay, one monument, there might be a little overlap, but basically you have one monument leading into another. And, and um, you know, and that, that's, that seen fine in, in the model and so on. But that, are all monuments of the same order? I mean, you could say this is an ontological question in terms of categorization, but, you know, do we, do we really... If you say, oh, is that the same as, you know, Stonehenge the same as uh, a large passage grave? or something? No, no, no. But it's almost, again, it's almost latent that we, see, we feel that these are equivalents in some way. And again, that's something I just quite like to problematize and, and question. So I want to quick, very quickly, within my ten minutes, uh, nip off to Caithness, right at the... There's, there's Caithness right next to Orkney, which, of course, you'll all know because it's been so widely looked at. And what do we find there? We find in the early Neolithic, we have these uh, chambered tombs, and they're very distinctive because, as you can see, they've got horns. They're long horn cans. Now, these, these were looked at, uh, on, have been looked at on and off, and particularly back in the 1960s. And uh, someone called Corcoran, who was based in Glasgow, excavated Tulka Shornak, and he found that the front, a lovely built stone chamber, a beautiful small megalithic tomb, which is actually reconstructed several times. But when he looked at the, at the, the body of the mound, so just to go back. So, effectively, he says it starts off as a small chambered tomb and gets added to, the same as we've seen over and over again over the last day or so. But when you look at the architecture or the construction of the body of them, it's total rubbish. It's composed of upright orthostats, and in some cases, like stone boxes running along the spine, and stones are just lent against it, lent against it, like, like tents or chimneys or tiles on a roof. And, but of course, once it's covered with smaller pieces of stone or perhaps, as Vicky suggested, turf or whatever, you can't see that construction. It looks really good. But of course, what happens is it falls down. And that's, and that's just an aside, this sort of feeling that because, and this is often in the literature, because build, people are building in stone, they're seeing this as an immutable sub, you know, it's, it's going to last, for, last forever. Is that true? Is that, you know, can we think about that in all stone monuments? I would suggest not. This is, just, this is a plan of Tulakashonak, and you can see just how, this is, see these orthostats, Loads of them all over the place, these boxes and stones just lead, leaning against them. So, a, a really poor form of construction, giving at first a spectacular result, but then it goes all goes a little bit wrong. And here's you can see this what's happened here it, the whole spine of the monument has collapsed with these boxes. So, you've got a, a big horn cairn coming like this, and all along the spine. It's, you've had this form of collapse. 
So, and this is, although they recognized that these were um, composite or they had phases, essentially this is seen as an early Neolithic form of monumentality. So let's go to Orkney. And basically I'm talking about uh, a series of horn cairns which haven't really been drawn out as a, you know people talk, know about the Orcadian stalled cairns but there's also these horn cairns in different places across Orkney and this is head of work and as you see a very similar form than we've seen in Case Ness now for those of you who don't really know much about uh, Scotland or Orkney and so on, um, there's a huge concentration of work being undertaken on Orkney, very little in Caithness, and, and people like myself, I suppose, are partly guilty for that. But, but clearly, you have, you've got, we've got a sim, very similar monuments being constructed on Orkney. And of course, because there's so much known about Orkney, and because the Orkney Neolithic is seen as so fine with its settlements and passage graves, it's always seen as a sense, somehow as a centre, and somewhere like Caithness much more of a backwater because it doesn't seem to have stone circles and passage graves. And yet these things are turning up in Orkney. Well, um, just, a, just a little story really, I suppose, as part of a project I did with uh, Jane Downs and Sean Jones in different parts of uh, Orkney and the Western Isles. This is the Ring of Brodga. We looked, for the comp we looked at the composition of the circles and we looked for the quarries where the stones came from because we were arguing that construction is essentially a, a social process. And so Vestra Fold, but right next to the quarry of Vestra Fold, this is, sorry, this is, this is large stones being quarried out of the rock there and we find them in the Ring of Brogger. Also at Vestra Fold, was a, la a large or substantial horn cairn. And totally unexpected, because it didn't look like it, but you can see this exactly the same architecture. Um, you have these slabs leaning against, there's a, there would have been a line of boxes running up there, slabs, le slabs leaning, a rough revetment wall put round. I just got a few. And there on the top part of a sort of circular, so this would be the circular part of the, of the horn can. This bit just to show that, and again, just to give you some idea of the construction. This is bad construction, and, it, and in this case, it has, it's really full. The, wood, the box line would have been along here. The whole lot has sort of collapsed that way, come in. Well, I, lo I, I didn't mind that, and I thought, oh, this is fine, because this, early, this is an early monument. What it's showing is that this place is also already imbued with importance. It's a place of the ancestors already, and so I can understand why they're using it as a quarry. Just another shot. And then we had the dates back from the Horn Cairn. And lo and behold, they are building the Horn Cairn at the same time that they're quarrying stones for the stone circle. Now, many of you will think, but for Neolithic people, this, this, is, this is, can't be right. But it is right, because these dates are coming from, from bone, which is sealed actually in the construction of the, of the horn can. So then that, so, what, so you can, well, okay, in the late Neolithic, in, in the sort of 2000 to 800, 2600 period, they're building essentially what we've always assumed to be early Neolithic monuments. And not only that, they're building them in a manner which internally are quite rubbish, but it, the external appearance is really quite spectacular. And the work we did at the Ring of Prodgar, we did, we did small excavations there in 2009. What did we find? Well, we found some really quite strange things. The first was that the stones were only embedded in the ground about that much. Now, these are quite massive stones, and they'd fallen over, most of them. Most of these were re-erected early in the, in the 20th century. The other thing was that it's got two entrances. Oh. One there and one there. And as the stones come closer to the entrances, they get actually closer together and they use wider stones. So again, this is all about imagery. 
and where you enter and leave the monument, it looks really good. I mean, it looks quite good anyway, but around the outside, you have much wider spacing of stone. So even in a, what we would say a classic late Neolithic monument, a big stone circle, it seems to be much more about imagery rather than substance. I haven't got time to go into this, but basically this would be this, this, this sort of uh, Levi Strauss's Society of Maison. This would be the kind of society I would envisage running through the Neolithic. And I suppose the bottom line here is my argument would be, actually, there's not a great deal of change in the Neolithic, particularly in Orkney, despite the fact you get these villages. Because what you find running through the Neolithic are houses which, in the, in the earlier part, are fairly widely spaced, 100 metres apart, 150 metres apart. As you go through, they seem to get closer together. It's almost like the lack of kinship is drawing people together to create a proximic relationship, just as Levi Strauss and other people have argued for house societies. And in those societies, authority and power is legitimated through descent, ancestry, claimed ancestry. And that may be well why we're seeing horn cairns built at this time. But it's not just monuments which have got this it's surface over substance, because even grooved ware, lovely grooved ware, I've always liked grooved ware, but it's in Orkney, it's rubbish pottery, but it's covered up, it's surface, it's skin, by a lovely slip, and then it's decorated. So when you look at a grooved ware pot, just like when you look at a monument, everything looks fine, but beneath the surface is r rubbish. I do like it as well, this stuff. And then you think more broadly about the, the, the late Neolithic. And this is kind of wandering into an area which I've got obsessed with over the last couple of years about wrapping things and so on. But it seems like the surface, the skin of things, becomes a very, very important issue in the late Neolithic. And I think you see that manifest in a whole series of different forms of material culture. And we, as part of the, the Stone Circle project, we also excavated the circle at Callanish, a very famous complex of stone circles. All the stones had fallen down. They'd fallen down because they were just put up and then propped up by some stones, just wedging the stone in place. This isn't the architecture of longevity. This is the architecture of expediency. And <clears throat> so all these... So, you know, some of our classic late Neolithic monuments are really badly built, are very superficial, and seem to be very much about appearance. And I just want to, you know, stone... Some say, well, how can you say that? How can you say these, these monuments aren't meant to last forever? What about Stonehenge? It's huge stones, amazing architecture. Well, of course, the truth about Stonehenge is only the front survives. Here's the avenue coming up, and there's the front. Where's the pack? If you say, oh, people say, oh, they've st it's stone, been, stone has been robbed. Well, that seems to be particularly special pleading. They've only taken stones at the back. And uh, I was talking to someone the other day, and, and they were saying, because I'd written a paper with Chris Tilly where we argued that there were no stones at the back. And someone else, this other, uh, Hugo, was saying, well, maybe it was just more badly built at the back and it fell over and those stones are easier to take away. Well, you can take either of those. The point is, the front survives, the very thing which is being seen, but the back, the thing where you do, is not there. <laughs> and that's it. Um, so my argument basically is that... I. Th and again, I, I may be just speaking for myself, but the Renfrew model has had an effect. And even though I wouldn't express it in those ways, I, I felt that there is this some form of evolution. But now I'm arguing that there's not. And that what we've mistaken for a lovely sequence isn't a sequence of monuments. And that a lot of the large monuments are built piecemeal by the very same people, striving and working towards, if you like, prestige, status, but very short-termism. So the British Neolithic is one of surface over substance. Thank you.